On this episode of the Naturist Living Show, plans for a new nude oasis and the owner of two Naturist Resorts in the western U.S. This episode of the Naturist Living Show is brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. At Bear Oaks, we offer traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Free your body, free your mind. www.bearoaks.ca Welcome, dear listener, to episode number 62 of the Nature's Living Show. It's December 2013, and my name is Stéphane Deschain. I'm your host for this episode of the Nature's Living Show, and I'm also the owner of Bear Oaks Family Nature's Park. And I am very happy to be announcing that the 2014 trip to France that uh, we have been talking about in previous episode is a go. 2013 was a great success. We had 29 people. A lot of people had fun. People have been asking because they want to go again. Or people who didn't make it last time want to go this time. So we've done some adjustment. We were working uh, before with the idea that it was everything was set um, and the flight was taken care of to get group rates. But then what we found is we actually had people from all over the place. We had people from Belgium, uh, from a couple of different areas in the U.S. and Canada. So trying to organize a group flights doesn't necessarily make sense um, so what we're doing this time is we're just providing the core uh, trip portion in Europe and then you organize the flight uh, and that main transportation to get over there directly with a travel agent so it means they can, you can be more flexible you can uh, if you have points as some people were saying you can use those points uh, air miles or aeroplane or frequent flyer points or whatever they're called to book your flight if you want um, or depending where you're f- coming from, it might be better to route yourself to a different city than Paris to go to Bordeaux. So it gives you more options. It also allows us to offer choices. So for this trip, you'll have the choice of doing one week or two weeks at the CHM Montalive in Bordeaux on the Atlantic. And, uh, and that's because after one week, several people said they wish they were staying longer. And it is beautiful, and you certainly get into a new uh, rhythm of life when you're over there, getting up in the morning and maybe going for a swim in the ocean before going to have breakfast in one of the restaurants or coffee shops or buying your fresh baguette every morning and then uh, heading over to the water park or to some sort of activity or the spa. So many things to do. And then we had an opportunity to visit uh, a winery, a, f- a couple of wineries in Bordeaux in uh, the medieval village of saint Emilion, and we're going to make that available again. But there's many other things to see around there. And by making the option for two weeks, it means that you don't mind also going if you want on a few other excursions that are going to be available to different areas like Arcachon, which is a really uh, famous place for oysters. And there's this massive sand dune that you can go visit. Uh, Bordeaux itself is a wonderful city you could spend a whole day in. So one week or two weeks at the CHM in Bordeaux. And then the option of a few more days in Paris. And so, therefore, you can adjust your flights accordingly. So, anyway, to find out all that information, just go to bareoaks.ca slash France. And all the details will be there. For those who are fans of Doctor Who, you've no doubt seen the uh, Christmas special. Um, Doctor Who, for those who don't know, has been around, uh, just had a 50th uh, anniversary, 50 years of being on the air with some time, some downtime in between. Um, It was the 800th episode that was the Christmas special that just aired on Christmas Day. And that's where you change from the 11th Doctor to the 12th Doctor. Without getting into a long story, Doctor Who is a time-traveling time lord, and he doesn't die exactly. He just changes from one persona to another, one body to another, uh, which is a convenient uh, tool, of course, for the producers and the writer of the show, because then they can keep 
uh, changing uh, actors, and the, that explains the actor. But it also makes for very interesting uh, transitions and personalities um, and storylines. But the reason I'm mentioning it is because the this particular episode, the, the uh, 800th episode, the uh, uh, the Christmas special um, had some naturist themes to it. Uh, and uh, to make a long story short, it has to do with going to the papal mainframe uh, to meet the mother superior, Tasha Lem, uh, uh, who is the head of this, this space church. Um, but the church has a whole military aspect. It acts as a sort of uh, UN of space, keeping peace and keeping things organized. And uh, well, I've let me play the clips from the uh, uh, from the show that had to do with the nature's themes, as you'll hear. Um, and I, I've edited this to put all the elements together that are relevant. And there's stuff in between uh, that either doesn't work well without the visual or is not as relevant to what I'm going to discuss. Clara! No, stop. Stop. Don't move. Don't do anything. Why? What is it? What's wrong? You're naked. Yes, I am naked. I wondered if you'd notice. Doctor, why are you naked? Because I'm going to church. Ooh. Better? Oh, that was quick. Hologram clothes projected directly onto your visual cortex. So you're still naked underneath? Everybody's naked underneath. What's that? Papal mainframe. It's like a great big flying church. The first ship to arrive. They're the ones who shielded the planet. They can get us down there. Friend of yours? That's a limb. Mother Superiors! Oh, she's inviting us aboard. Why? Because I asked her. It's one of this. What is that? Your hologram projector. You can't go to church with your clothes on. I don't feel like I'm wearing anything. I know. Relaxing, isn't it? What's this place? Church of the Papal Mainframe, security hub of the known universe. A security church? Yep. Keeping you safe in this world and the next. I venerate the exaltation of the Mother Superiors. Welcome to the Church of the Papal Mainframe. Your nudity is appreciated. Hey, babes. Loving the frock. Is that a new body? Give us a twelve. Touch this old thing, please. I've been rocking it for centuries. Nice, though. Tight. So, uh, hello. What's here? Clara, this is Tash Lem, the head of the church of the papal mainframe. Tash. So as you can hear, it, it's about nudity. It's about uh, not wearing clothes. Except that the way they deal with it, the tool they deal, because they couldn't put nudity very easily, I guess, on the BBC uh, or anywhere else. Um, although there, there certainly have been shows about with nudity on the BBC, and uh, we've talked about those. Uh, but perhaps this is not the show, or the actors didn't want to do it. At any rate, they deal with it by uh, using it, the tool of the idea that they're using uh, this holographic uh, imagery of clothing that's projected directly on their uh, their retina, and so they, uh, the the more sensitive uh, Clara, who's from Earth and obviously has issues with nudity and body image, just like uh, most people in the textile world, um, she doesn't have to deal with it because she perceives the clothes, even though, as they point out, they're still really nude, herself included. And um, the question is whether this was purely meant to be comic relief, and certainly it has uh, amusing tones to it, especially for the people um, the textiles who are uncomfortable with the idea of nudity or understand these things. But on the other hand, uh, the doctor is very comfortable, quite at ease with the nudity. Um, he's, he's, he seems to be confused. And you've got to understand a doctor being a time lord um, is not human. It doesn't have the same hang-ups. And maybe we are making fun. Maybe we are laughing. Maybe this is comic relief. But perhaps uh, the writers saw the ridiculousness of the whole fear and embarrassment and shame that we have of our bodies so uh, maybe we're laughing at ourselves as in it and, and nudity 
here, as you can hear, is a sign of respect. Um, the the uh, priest says that the nudity is appreciated because it's a sign, perhaps, of humility and respect uh, to the uh, priests and the church itself. So I saw some pretty neat, albeit subtle, uh, nature's themes and values, and perhaps uh, the author, perhaps Stephen Moffat, is a naturist himself. Who knows? In my role as uh, on the board of the INF, um, I get information from all over the world, which is interesting, but particularly uh, non-European countries, which is my area. And from that standpoint, very exciting to announce that uh, we have a new federation in Mexico that has formed, and uh, they've just been recognized. And there's another one in Thailand that's considering joining the INF as well, which is also a new federation. Um but uh, there is unfortunately some uh, difficulties in Australia. So I just wanted to mention this on the show because I know we have Australian listeners. Um, the ANF, the Australian Naturist Federation, is having some challenges. Um, they, in the last meeting, they were unable to have quorum. And so they have a whole bunch of money in the bank, but they're not doing very much. And they, the president, uh, Greg, is actually as the acting president because the former president uh, has resigned, and there's so he took over because to fill the gap as the acting president. But uh, people need to be involved. Um, I know there's a lot of criticism that, that I've also heard and read about in Australia that the ANF doesn't do very much and it has problems. Uh, and perhaps it doesn't. Clearly, if people aren't involved, it, that's a problem in itself. Greg and is, is asking for people to be involved. Um, he is uh, stressed and he can't do it all himself and he needs, uh, he needs assistance. And he needs, in order for the ANF to continue, it needs people to be involved. Some people would wish it to not continue. I think it's probably easier to get involved and change the ANF from within than try to start a brand new federation from scratch. But uh, I'm far away, and it's hard for me to know exactly what's going on all uh, that way. But I just thought I would share that with anybody who's listening in Australia, that if you want to get involved, you do need a federation. It's important to have a federation in every country because it, it, it provides a point of focus for naturism, a point for government to contact, a point for the media to contact, a uh, an, a starting point for information, whether it's on the web, that provides credibility to movement and provides credibility to the clubs and resorts and beaches and can do the lobbying and all that. And uh, if that's not being done well, it doesn't mean that the uh, possibility is not there to do it. Uh, federations are important. Every movement, every sport, every hobby, every ideal, every philosophy has some sort of central organizing body in, almost, in most countries where the movement has strength. And naturism can't be any different. <laughs> You may recall uh, Joshua Williams, uh, the fashion designer, who uh, was interviewed for the episode on fashion that we did in October of 2011. Uh, I'll provide a link to that in the show notes. You can listen to it again if you want. Uh, Joshua and I have kept in touch. In fact, he came to visit Bear Oaks with his family uh, last summer. And uh, he's, he has an idea. And uh, he wants to do something new. He wants to build something new. Because believe it or not, in New York City, there is no place to go in the winter in a, in a core of New York City that you can get to by transit if you want to try naturism. So um, I gave him a call so he could discuss this idea and share it with you. Joshua, you had uh, an interesting article uh, on the YNA blog. Yes, yes. I had talked to uh, Felicity and Jordan at, uh, at YNA, and we had talked a lot about uh, you know things that were being planned for the winter uh, for this year, and uh, you know in the New Jersey, New York, Connecticut metropolitan area, uh, there's there's a fair amount of clubs um, in New Jersey. There's uh, three within um, you know I'd say within an hour to two hours from um, New York City. But there's really nothing that's open year round. Um, all of them are fairly rural areas, and um, you know it's it's a little bit hard for uh, a New Yorker to get out there as it is during the summer. But uh, obviously during the winter, um, you know even if it was open, there there wouldn't be anything. So we started talking about you know what would something look like in an urban environment um, 
you know, that wasn't the traditional, um, you know, club with a, a lake or a pool, but, you know, something that was smaller, uh, more manageable. And, uh, and uh, they suggested that I write an article about it and, and uh, see what kind of comments we got back. So is this something that uh, you're planning on doing or you wish somebody else would do? Or what, what, how, where do you want to go with this? Well, you know, it's something that I, I've been thinking about for a few years. Um, I'm an entrepreneur at heart, and so I'm always looking at uh, potential uh, business opportunities or projects that uh, uh, you know sort of line up with my own life or my lifestyle. And obviously, uh, naturism is something that uh, you know is an important part of my life. So, so yeah, you know, when I decided to write the article, I really wanted to look at it uh, specifically to. Well, to to reality, I wanted to see, um, you know, is there a real opportunity there from a business point of view, um, rather than you know an idealistic point of view of you know if if I had a million dollars, what would I do with it sort of uh, uh, approach. So, describe to us exactly what right now what you think it might look like. Well, you know, I've have been to a, a couple of different places um, th- uh, in the area. One uh, is a Korean spa, and I was always somewhere where that I go during the winter. Um, uh, it's a, it's actually a rather large facility just outside of New York City, and uh, there is nudity, full nudity there, but it's uh, separated between the sexes. Um, but I've always been really impressed uh, just how it's run. It's it's very much a business, and yet it's very much a place that people go and spend. Uh, you know, they'll spend the day. Uh, p- part of that is is some of the spa uh, uh, offerings that are there. But uh, also, it's th- they have a lot of places just to sit, play games, uh, talk to people, have uh, lunch or dinner. And, uh, you know, that, that was sort of what appealed to me. Um, and I thought, now this particular place is, is very large, and obviously it's very much geared towards the Korean population, although uh, people from, you know, from all cultures go. Um, but I thought, you know, what if, if there was something along those same lines on a smaller scale, you know, that was uh, in New York City proper or, or along a transportation line, you know, within 15 minutes of the city uh, that, uh, you know, maybe was more along the lines of 4,000 to 6,000 square feet uh, as opposed to uh, this Korean spa, which is four, you know, floors. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, trying to, dis- to kind of imagine um, what that kind of a space would look like within the confines of a, you know, of a smaller footprint. Um, obviously, real estate in this area is very expensive, uh, so that's one consideration for that. Um, but also, I think uh, you know one of the things that I've noticed uh, after I put the article up is, is there's a lot of comments about how this is going to be very expensive and uh, you know a bit of pie in the sky, and and I think that's because um, at least from the naturist blogs that I read and such, there is there is an idealism about the perfect space, right? And <laughs> You know, and, and again, uh, I go back to this idea, okay, you know, I have an ideal of what I'd like, but what is what is realistic? And I think uh, having a smaller space, uh, you know, maybe starting um, with a common room and, and, a, and a hot spa or hot sauna rather, um, and maybe a steam room. Um, and, you know, just starting there. Um, so, and, so not an indoor water park with a lazy river and <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, I I love to swim, and I would love nothing more than a swimming pool I could go swim, you know, nude in uh, every day. But uh, I, I don't think that that's probably the the easiest thing to go solve. Uh, whereas putting a hot sauna in might be, you know, or a dry sauna rather would be uh, fairly reasonable. Um, so, so you know, I imagine a space where you walk in. Obviously, there's a bit of a foyer or or, or an area that uh, you know you, where you're uh, welcomed, uh, and then of course you go into an area where you would uh, change out of your clothes, and uh, and then uh, once you've changed out of your clothes, that there's uh, essentially a big common area where people uh, can can gather, um, and then also you know a small uh, spa, if you will, um, you know that has the sauna or the steam room or some of those uh, things that I think are are uh, you know, are worth, or an opportunity, I guess, to socialize. Um, mm. I also imagine, you know, the thing is, is I've been thinking a lot about uh, sort of our culture as it is right now. I think so much of what we do socially online, especially the millennials, is very much online. It's all about connecting online. And and one of the, you know, the, the better things that I think that have come out of that is the meetup uh, uh, website. And, um, you know, it just keeps... It, the idea keeps coming to me that there's uh, so many opportunities or ideas for, for groups to meet up, but there's not a lot of space for that. And I thought, you know, why not have a space where 
uh, somebody who might want to lead a nude, nude yoga class or, or nude Pilates or uh, might want to do uh, art drawing classes, you know, and have nude models and that sort of thing, where there's no question because that's already part of who we are, that, that nudity isn't the, you know, the elephant in the room, it's it's the expected. And I thought that might be an interesting um, take on, on what's happening online. Now, uh, naturism or nudism in North America actually started in the uh, 20s in New York City with the rental of pools for uh, that's right new activity. Does that not happen in the winter anymore? It does. There's actually Travis Sons um, is a non-landed club in Long Island, and they actually have a pool party once a month uh, at the World Gym in Wanta. Um, the issue there is mostly transportation. So for me, even though it's maybe 30 miles away, it would take about an hour and a half to get there. Um, and so it, it becomes sort of, you know, a trip. <laughs> right. Uh, and, you know, anytime you have to drive through the city, uh, it becomes a bit problematic. So, so yeah, the, the, those are definitely there. And in fact, uh, you know, the Travisons commented on the blog post itself and, you know, said, hey, something like this sort of exists. I think that the two differences is that I'm, I'm interested in a space that's, um, you know, there seven days a week. Um, whether or not it's, you know, nude every single day, I think, uh, again, depends on uh, the amount of traffic that you can get and the amount of uh, uh, ma market available to you. But, um, you know, right now, uh, Travis Sons is, you know, once a month. So it's, uh, it's more of a, an event rather than a, um, you know, a community space. Yeah, the, the challenge with any niche business like Naturism is that you when you start, you have a much smaller market to draw from. Eventually, when you build up the business, it's much more, much stronger because you have almost no competition. But yeah, exactly. You have to be able to 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 to, to survive in the first few <laughs> years as you build up a clientele. Uh, so you think it's viable? You think it's financially viable to do this? I do, I do, and, and the reason why is because um, you know I've been thinking about this too. With, you know, does it need to be nude all the time? Uh, does it need to be? You know, what what kind of space is it? And um, you know, my I think I start with my ideal, and then I work back backwards a bit, and and say you know from a business point of view, from a uh, operations point of view, what can I do? And so I was thinking about this the other day. I mean, I would I would think, um, and this isn't exactly where I would love to go but if I could have a place that was open that was nude only two days a week you know that's already uh, better than once a month um, mm -hmm. and if that were the case um, you know what other uh, you know if I do have amenities like a hot sauna and a spa or a hot tub or things like that and a common space where there's no issues with uh, art drawing classes and things like that um, you know, I, I might be able to fill it just by the the need within the market for for a, for an open space, um, and then of course over time build that into you know uh, okay so three days four days uh, are are nude only. Uh, the other thing you know that I I thought of is there was a lot of conversation about how it would be very difficult to have a an you know nudity within a a physical space or at least build it on that and I go back to um, you know there's been some examples in the comments and such um, you know there's again the Korean spa is is uh, it's separated by sex but it's still nude and it's expected there's a f there's a few Russian banyas in the area that uh, nude nudity is is um, expected again um, mostly um, uh, you know by sex um, and then there, are, of course, there are places in America. There's Kiva. There's uh, some other, um, you know, bathhouses and things like that. Um, but they all go back to a culture. You know what I mean? So, so there's, a, you know, like a Finnish sauna. People expect it. And I think um, sometimes the nudity idea becomes, if it becomes the the only cell point or the main cell point, um, you know, then it becomes controversial. Where, you know, I look at a lot of these websites, and nudity is just one of the you know, the FAQs. <laughs> oh, by the way, you know, when you're in the spa, there, there's no clothing. <laughs> well, and, and you know, when, when I, and I certainly talk about this all the time, that that's not the point of naturism, isn't actually the nudity, even though that's what everybody likes to talk about. Exactly. It, it's it's a whole bigger philosophy. So yeah, it could be a place that's, the the, the point is body acceptance and, and, and the whole self and health, mental and physical health and stuff. 
right. uh, could be a point. So, but to the, the Korean places you talk, you said four stories. Is it all Koreans? Does it only attract Koreans? Ah, uh, no, no, no. I mean, it's it's definitely um, because it's part of their everyday life. I mean, a lot of people will go there every day and take their showers there and prepare for the day. Um, so, so definitely they're the um, main population. But when I go there, there's usually um, I would say at any given time four or five. You know, Caucasians. Um, um, you know, a lot of uh, Russians I've noticed go there. So again, people from Europe that I think that are used to these kinds of uh, uh, places. And you know, it's really interesting is you'll get a lot of. Um, uh, if you go to Yelp, it's interesting to read the comments because it's inevitably it's about the nudity, <laughs> <laughs> right? And uh, you know what's really interesting because it's not within the naturist or the nudist uh, uh, commentary. It's it's all about well, you know, it's a little weird that people are naked, but you get over it. It's fine. It's great. You know, it's it's such a great spa for the price, and um, yeah, that's you know they get over it quickly. And uh, so I think you know if it's just an expectation. Uh, so so again, let's go back to this. If if you know um, Monday through Wednesday, let's say it was uh, clothing optional. Uh, well, let's say that it was uh, nude only in this in the spa area, but everything else was clothing. And then you know Thursday through Sunday was nude only. Um, I don't think it would freak out most people because I think there's an expectation when you go to some of these places, especially if they're framed within a cultural context. Um, I don't think people care. Um, I think sometimes people get a little annoyed when it's pushed on them, let's say, or that it's, you know, the main reason to be there. And then it, it gets a little weird because it's like they have to be, you know, uh, subscribed to, to everything that, na you know, they have to say, oh, um, am I a naturist or not? And I think, you know, some people just aren't ready to do that, but they're fine being naked. <laughs> yeah, well, I, and, and in fact, I'm a little surprised that the, even the naturist concept doesn't exist in New York City. Um I mean, that's it's one of the biggest cities in North America with an extensive subway system, and you're telling me that I I cannot go to a naturist event once a month by subway? No, no, there's nothing by subway. Uh, in fact, to get out to Long Island, you'd either have to drive or take a train, um, and then um, do a little bit of walking. So it's not it's not easy. <laughs> wow. Uh, I mean, why do you think that is? I mean, you, you, they certainly, you know, if Toronto can support an urban swim once a month in the winter that you can get to by subway, why, why doesn't it exist in, in New York City? Yeah, it's a good question. I think a lot of it comes down to, to cost. I think, um, you know, real estate is quite expensive, although it is in Toronto as well. Um, I, I know that it's, it's somewhat the same in terms of space availability and price. Um, you know, and then also traditionally the pools have been, um, you know, the, the pools are um, publicly owned, most of them. So uh, most New Yorkers, if they're going to go to the pool, they either go to a public owned pool or they go to uh, a YMCA. Um, so there isn't a lot of private pool um, mm. unless it's a hotel. Um, and I know that there are hotels that have had naked swims, but those, again, are more of an event and more of a less, decidedly less naturist <laughs> events, yeah. you know. So, but yeah, there's, it's, it is a bit surprising that there's nothing, you know, there. There's, there are cultural institutions, uh, the Russian uh, bathhouse in the East Village, um, you know, it's, it's definitely gone through different, um, I mean, it's, it, at its core, it's still a Russian bathhouse, but during the 80s, it was very much perceived as a place for, for gay men to congregate and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, I think there's a little bit of the, um, you know, of the traditional things that exist that are probably not part of the larger naturist or nudist community or awareness. Um, and then also there's, I think, some of the stigmas that are still connected um, with some of those places that do allow nudity. The, the the pessimist will say that it doesn't exist because there's no demand in it. And mm -hmm. uh, But me as the optimist, I think that perhaps there's just nobody has really done anything about it. The opportunity exists, but it always comes down to somebody with the vision and then the drive to make it happen. And so I think you, maybe you have something there for sure because it's <laughs> it's proven in other cities that it is interest. So 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 what's the next step? When when are you opening? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to open next year. Um, I think the uh, the next step for me is I'm in the process of putting together a Kickstarter campaign. Um, I think that that might be an interesting uh, crowdsourcing grassroots way of getting. Um, feedback and also uh, funding. 
Um, it's something that I'm uh, actually in the process of building as we speak. Um, I, you know, it's interesting to look at these crowdsourcing or crowdfunding platforms because um, there are some limitations in what you can and can't do. Um, so I'm curious to see how this that plays out. Um, but, but I'm also, you know, interested in just getting uh, a lot of comments back, uh, f- you know, from people who are interested. Um, I'm, you know, one of the things I'm looking for is potentially a business partner that might have uh, more um, experience in the real estate uh, area. Um, that is a big component of doing this in New York City, um, is understanding, you know, how to, to get the right uh, space in the right area and, uh, you know, uh, overcome some of the legal issues that might occur with, I think, less so with the, the nudity and more so with, uh, you know, having the, the spa and those kinds of facilities within the building. So if somebody wants to help you or get in touch with you or contribute to the Kickstarter campaign, how do they get t- in touch with you? So the easiest way is I have an email, uh, njfamilynaturists at gmail.com. So that's NJ is in New Jersey, family naturists, plural, at gmail.com. Um, that will be uh, how the Kickstarter campaign can be found as well. Um, again, that'll probably be up in about uh, two weeks, so uh, early first thing in the year. Um, and uh, you know, I'd, I'd welcome anybody who's interested in, in discussing it from a business point of view, or just simply interested in sharing their comments. I, you know, I think uh, you know, with with social media and all these different communication vehicles, uh, perhaps uh, just getting the conversation going and getting people excited and, and participating might be part of you know what has stopped it in, in the in the meantime. Well, I'll put a link then that information in the show notes, and I'll put a link to the uh, YNA article as well that you wrote. So uh, it sounds exciting. I mean, good <laughs> luck. Crossed fingers, crossed fingers. I mean, I, 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 like I said, I love entrepreneurship. I love uh, the idea of you know tackling something where I, I think there's a need in the market, and I think there's a need. So, and I think you know, having been to YNA events, I know there's at least a hundred to two hundred people that uh, you know are looking for something like this, and that's a good start. So, welcome back to cold New York, Felicity. Hi, <laughs> Stefan. Yes, we're back in cold New York. I just got a lot of snow this week, actually. Well, not a lot, but not what we're used to. <laughs> How was California in the end? Did you have a good time? Yeah, it was beautiful. We had also gone, after Terracotta, we actually also went to um, Living Water Spa. This holding optional spa with uh, mineral water, um, hot tub and pool. It was nice. Very nice. Yeah. Well, I just had, uh, you know, there's not much to do in the New York area, but I noticed you had a uh, uh, a blog or a guest blog on the YNA site from Joshua about this idea of having this seven-day-a-week sort of nature spa thing. So I just talked to him, and he told me all about it. So just thought I'd ask you what you think of the idea. Right, yeah. Um, I think it's a great idea, and I think if it was done right, it would be successful. Um, you know, obviously we have a lot of spas in New York City, um, in Queens, and Long Island, and some of them have um, just like limited clothing optional times or, you know, they're not co-ed or whatever. And then we have the Travis Sons, which does a swim uh, monthly event uh, at this gym spa place in Long Island and you know people were bringing that up but it's like both of us were like well this is different this is not just a monthly event it's like we want to have our own very own space that you could go to at any time um so yeah that's like some of what people were saying um I'm sure you guys were talking about the comments a little bit not uh yeah what, what surprised me is that you know the that there's nothing in New York, the core of New York, with all that population, there's no place you can get to by transit. Uh, like, you have to get in a car and drive pretty far, and that, that seems surprising to me that nobody's really doing anything naturist in, you know, the urban area that, for people who don't have cars, lots of people in New York don't have cars, right? Right, yeah. It's a problem when we do events at the at the nudist clubs that are outside of New York City, upstate or in New Jersey, because they're just really difficult to get to. <laughs> 
So when you have YNA events, do you hold them in a, so that you can get to it by transit, or do you have to have a car for all the YNA parties and things you do? No, we well, it depends. Um, we've done a lot of events in Manhattan and in New York City that are accessible by the subway. Um, some, well, one club, I mean, Rock Lodge is accessible by bus, but once you get to this one bus stop, and if it's on a Saturday or a Sunday, um, you have to walk or bike or get a taxi from this bus station. And it's really a hassle. It takes like two and a half hours, three hours when it shouldn't take that long to get there. Oh. It's not that far away. But um, yeah, most of them are just a um, bit of a hassle to get to without a car. You could rent a car also, but it's difficult. We try to arrange carpooling when we do events outside of New York City for New Yorkers. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like getting to Bear Oaks by transit. You've got to take two or three trains or buses, and then even at the very last one, last bus stop, you still have a three-kilometer walk. Um, I, and if it's the weekend, there's no bus service. So, yeah. yeah. So that's pretty harsh. So, yeah, it sounds like a... Well, I mean, it sounds like a good opportunity for New York. I, do you think it would work? I think it would. Um, you know, people have also been concerned about alcohol and nudity laws or just, like, the law or regulations, like, getting in the way. But, I mean, in this case, I, I wasn't even thinking about alcohol because it's like, this is a health and wellness center, a spa. I mean, you don't need it. Yeah, um, I mean, how many spas do you go and have <laughs> drinks at? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a money maker, I guess. And, you know, nudist clubs have bars, but, like, for this, you know, I don't think it's that big of a concern. Concern or, or in the plan would be in the plan, so I, don't, I think yeah. it would succeed. Um, Let's do some shots in between those saunas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't seem to, doesn't seem to work for me anyway. <laughs> yeah, just get naked and drunk. <laughs> yeah. oh, God, oh, well. there'd be death. Well, I hope I hope he gets somewhere. I hope he can make it work. So uh, we'll see. Yeah. And uh, what else is on your mind? Um, actually. Uh, we've also been talking about this documentary, kind of documentary movie called Free the Nipple, um, because it's been getting so much attention the last couple of weeks. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, no, I haven't. Tell me, tell me more about it. Yeah, it's about, it's basically about uh, top free equality, women having the right to go topless, just as men do. So what's the movie supposed to be about? Um, it's just supposed to be about um, how women should have this this right, that, that we should have this equality and that we don't. And uh, it's, I think, filmed mostly in New York City, um, where it is legal to be top free. Uh, women have, have had this right since 1992. Um, but, but there's still a problem because... As of this year, I think women are still getting arrested for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it it goes into that, and um, it it has a heavy focus on saying how you know we allow so much violence in the media, so much kids see so much violence on TV, and yet a nipple is like what everybody freaks out about. Hmm. And, you know, just they're focusing on how that doesn't make sense, which is good. You know, I think that's what people kind of, um, it's a way to reason with people and, and people understand that. So where's this movie at right now? They're actually raising money for it um, on a crowdfunding website. I think it's called Fund the Campaign. Um, if you Google, like, Free the Nipple, you would find it. They're trying to raise another $250,000 to uh to get it funded well i'm going to uh for sure make put a link to that in the show notes so that people can look at it yeah and um the reason they got so much attention the last couple of days is uh miley cyrus actually tweeted a picture of herself um topless she has her her boobs covered but she tweeted about it so she, they got, about the movie yeah about the movie Cool. She said something like, thank you, New York, for, for being a top free state. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, not that Miley Cyrus isn't always <laughs> the, the, the ideal role model for everybody, but, you know. I know, it's kind of funny. Well, Lena Esco um, 
I read this article that she actually was in a movie with Miley, so they kind of knew each other before. Oh. So, but it's good that she has that endorsement. I mean, um, Miley Cyrus is not exactly... It's, uh, it's kind of funny that, that uh, she she would show support for this anyway. She's, you know, she's been so much about nudity um, in a different way, you know, in a more like attention getting way and hmm. and everything. So, so how does it work? So if they get all the money in the crowdfunding, uh, how are they, they still have to do distribution and are they going to, is it going to be in movie theaters? Yeah, well they, they also got an NC-17 rating. Oh, is the movie shot already? Um, I think, yeah, I think they filmed most of it. They just need to do the editing and, you know, everything that comes after that. And uh, NC-17, because I'm not in the U.S., does that mean that you can't get in unless you're 18 years old? It's it's worse than an R rating. Wow. Um, yeah. I think you can't see it if, I think with R rating, you, you can see it accompanied by an adult if you're under 18. Um an NC-17, like, you have to be over 18. Wow, and that's because there's, like, really graphic violence in it? <laughs> Obviously <laughs> not. <laughs> so, it got... Yeah, there's, like, topless women fighting with swords and beheading each other. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, because that you can do and you can get, a, you know, a PG rating. Right, so. yeah, exactly, yeah. As long as the boobs are, the nipples are censored. Yes, exactly. You, you can, yeah, you can fight and... and sort each other all day but no. <laughs> what a ridiculous world isn't it yeah i mean it's just a the nc-17 thing is just a really terrible form of censorship like it's just i think she called it lena esco called it like the kiss of death like it just really hurts their distribution and and making money on it and everything like it's just censorship ah so, so that means they, they're they not going to get wide distribution because of that, I guess, unless they get a lot of attention, or will it be on Netflix or something like that? Yeah, hopefully they can still find a way, even if they have to deal with uh, this rating. I mean, they're trying to push the, they're bringing up also the, the MPAA, which is the, who makes these ratings, makes up the, the standards for what, for what everything is, you know, PG-13, what is R, etc., and, um, they're they're saying you know this hasn't gotten much better since the uh, what is it the Hayes Code yeah back in the day it's like they're like, they're saying it's not much better today you know look at this so I think it's it, even better if they can get the ratings changed well, there's a great uh, movie I watch and I think it's on Netflix called This Film Is Not Yet Rated and it's exactly about all that. Um, I, I don't know if I talked about it in one of the previous shows, but it's 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 this guy who's doing this this essentially this expose of the MPAA ratings and how the uh, the people who do it is this small group of people who have all this power and who just get offended by certain things. And essentially, it's that. It's like at the moment you see a penis, it's NC-17. And otherwise, right. you can behead people all day long. And there's like no rhyme or reason. If they don't like you, then they give you a nasty rating. So do you, yeah. nobody will ever see your film. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> I've heard of that movie. I don't think I've seen it. Yeah, that's that sounds pretty much how it is. <laughs> well, I'll put a link to that. And definitely everybody should listen, go and watch that movie if they have a chance. because that's Yeah. And I mean, we also don't, um, we don't know, we haven't seen, obviously we can't see much of the movie yet, um, so, you know, I want to support it, um, and it seems like they're doing great thing, but, you know, we don't know exactly what kind of angle they're going to take with the movie or anything, but people should definitely check it out. Okay, sounds great. I think I will definitely when I get off the phone with you. Yeah. So um, I'll put links to all that in the show notes. Anybody who wants to go and look at uh, either the, the, the movie I mentioned or the movie that uh, Felicity mentioned. And uh, what's happening with YNA? Are, do you have any events and things coming up? Yeah, we have an event coming up on January 25th. We're doing a, an evening with um, Sarah Eve Cardell. Uh, we're doing chocolate making. We're going to make raw chocolate. And then we're going to do a drum meditation. Oh, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, it'll be fun. And where do people find out more about that? 
And they can see it on our events page at yna.me. Click on Naked Events. Naked Events. Awesome. Yeah. The best kind. <laughs> right. <laughs> As you heard in past episodes, I did uh, a lot of interviews while I was in a cruise, a new cruise last February. And I have one more uh, in the can that I recorded last February, and I'm going to put it on now because I, it's been, uh, as it is, it's starting to be a, a bit of an old interview at this point, almost a year old, but it's all still very relevant. Um, I uh, had an opportunity and the privilege to sit down with uh, Suzanne Shell. And she is the owner, uh, well, her and her husband, of uh, two resorts out in uh, w the western United States. Laguna del Sol was her uh, first one in California. And not very long ago, they also purchased, uh, with others, uh, Mira Vista Resort in Arizona. And uh, these are two very upscale, very uh, developed, sophisticated resorts. And... Uh, so she provides an interesting insight into the uh, business and opportunity and future of naturism. Well, I'm Suzanne Shell, and I'm here on the Bear Necessities Cruise this week. And I'm also here with my husband, Wayne, and we're promoting our businesses, Laguna del Sol near Sacramento, California, and Mira Vista Resort in Tucson, Arizona. So you are the owners of the two resorts? We are. Um, we've had Laguna del Sol since 1984. And we've had Mira's Vista for seven years in May, so since 2006. So tell us a little bit about the, uh, the scale. How, how big are these? What are they like? Um, wow, they're completely different and about 900 miles apart. Um, Laguna del Sol is one of the largest resorts in the country and probably about the largest um, member-wise and you know, business-wise in the West. It's in a beautiful 250 acres of slightly the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, um, great location, a uh, huge mix of camping and club members and hotel and vacationers from all over the place and in the, it, right in between San Francisco and uh, Lake Tahoe and all the gold country and Yosemite, but, most, but it's a destination in itself too, lots to do there. So, so how many rooms, how many campsites? Um, pretty much unlimited campsites. Um, we have ones with hookups, about 100, and then tent sites all on grass. I think our, our permit says up to 400, so that's plenty. And then uh, 27 like rooms and cottages. So what made you decide to go in this business? Um, I was a child nudist. Grew up going to a place in Southern California with my family. Uh, met my husband there. And we had another business in Southern California, but we went up to a convention at Laguna del Sol, which was called Rawhide Ranch at the time, and owners wanting to retire, we ended up coming away from the weekend with a deal to buy it. So, uh, it, and we've steadily, it's just grown since then. It was a, you know, small to medium-sized uh, campground and club in the mid-80s, and over the 29 years, we've improved, expanded um, on it, and it's, you know, it's one of the premier resorts um, certainly in the country and maybe in the world now. And one resort wasn't enough. You had to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We actually um, started out with two partners. And one of our former par partners who owned a resort, another resort, um, found the Mira Vista property. Um, it was a, a little historic hotel that was closed at the time. And... Um, we went into partnership with that couple and another couple um, seven years ago. Um, thought that we'd just be involved a little bit, maybe, and then ended up with all of it uh, for the last, I think, four or five years. So, you know, the story is that there's a declining interest in nudism, naturism, and young people aren't into it. Uh, their, their business is bad. What would you say to that? Um, I'd say that we've had to work a little harder the last few years, but it's been growing every year. So I think you can't just sit back and hope people will come to you without a little bit of work and a little more promotion and a little more of getting the word out. Um, I'm also on the Anner board, so I work with the, um, the brand management and marketing committee on the board. And, you know, there are a lot of options for people. So you do, you know, that... You know, for there's a lot of competition for their leisure dollar, 
and um, we just have to try a little harder to let people know we're there. Once people find the places, you know, they're they love it. But you, it, it's you know, we're not the Hilton or we're not some gigantic resort like Carnival Cruise or something that has a little bit bigger marketing budget than we do. So um, once people find out about you, I think they really, um, you know, get that first visit in and then they want to come back. And what about young people? Is it just old folks that are interested? Uh, not at all. Um, certainly the largest group probably to start in nudism has always been the 35 to 55 just because... Um, it takes people a while to get comfortable with their bodies or realize that, you know, you only have one life to live and might as well enjoy it. It's passing by whether you're going to, you know, deprive yourself of doing things that are fun or not. Um, we have people of all ages, certainly. I was a child nudist. Um, both of our places are, you know, family friendly. Laguna del Sol is a kid's paradise. We've got, you know, a rope swing and a lake and paddle boats and kids activities and playgrounds and things like that. So it's certainly welcome to people of all ages. Um, because I grew up in a nudist family, um, I want other people to be able to enjoy that too and keep it affordable for families. Um, Mira Vista is a little bit not as uh, conducive to children's activities and things just because it's a smaller resort but they're certainly welcome and we have you know family members and we have visitors that come with children it's just not quite as common as at Laguna del Sol um you know you might come many times and there be no kids there so um for families that know that you know they're not expecting to be entertained it's it's perfect but it's not you know the primary thing but we're certainly welcome we're 100% Anner Club so uh, both of our places and um, it's important to us to stick to the, the values, principles and standards that Annard's had for since the 1930s. So in hindsight now, would you did you do uh, right to invest all your time and money in this business or would you have done better doing something else? Um, well, absolutely. Um, Laguna del Sol has been very good. I mean, it, it, you know, we, we had another business. My husband had a business, and we were fortunate to be able to invest some profits from that into the um, expansion of the facilities and the improvements at Laguna del Sol and at Mira Vista. Um, I think it does take, you know, I mean, that's... It's kind of what we do for fun. You know, we, we don't have a big boat, or we don't have um, a lot of other hobbies other than nudist vacations and travel and things but um, it's important I think to keep growing and improving and maintaining facilities um, and yeah we certainly that's this is our business and we do make a nice you know a, a living off it so it certainly can be done um, I think it's difficult for some of the smaller places and you do have to you know it's it's hard work too like I said, I like like any kind of business that you do on your own. It's you know you have to put a lot into it too, but it's it's fun. It's nice to be in a business where you know people come there because they're having fun. Well, that's all once again for this episode of the Naturist Living Show. Thank you as always for listening. Again, my name is Stéphane Deschain, and I'm your host for this podcast and the owner of Bear Oaks Family Nature's Park. You'll find links to all the things we talked about in the show in the show note on the show website, which is located at naturistlivingoneword.bearoaks.ca. That's B-A-R-E, Bear Oaks, of course, dot C-A, because we're in Canada. Please keep sending your comments and your suggestions. I always appreciate receiving them, and I read them all. And I try to respond. Well, I do respond to all of them, but sometimes I'm a little slow. Uh, the show's email address is naturistliving at bareoaks.ca. That's B-A-R-E, again, bareoaks.ca in Canada. Join us again in about a month for the next episode of The Naturist Living Show. This episode of The Naturist Living Show was brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. Traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Traditional values means that naturism is more than just taking your clothes off. It is a life philosophy with physical, psychological, environmental, social and moral benefits. Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park 
strives to promote those naturist values in a modern setting that provides the amenities and services that our members and visitors expect. Free your body, free your mind. Learn more at www.baroques.ca.